welcome to the Alabama Public Health Training Network. Today, we will discuss care coordination services for children referred through the DHR Early Head Start Grant. The focus of these services will address the assessment of medical services, education with medical compliance, linkage to community resources, as well as the billing process specific to this grant program. Thank you for joining us today for our program, Providing Care Coordination Services Through the DHR Early Head Start Partnership Grant. If you have a question about anything being discussed today, please call or email during our broadcast. The phone number and email address are on your screen now and will appear again later in the program. Also, the handouts are available online. You will need to register for this program in order to access that material. I'm Meredith Adams, Director of Social Work with the Bureau of Family Health Services at the Alabama Department of Public Health. And with me is Sean Pauk, Training Coordinator, and Melissa Godwin, the DHR Early Head Start Coordinator with the Bureau. Welcome, and now I will turn the program over to Sean and Melissa. Good morning. My name is Sean Park, and again, I want to welcome you to the DHR Early Head Start Partnership Training Program. We are excited about our initiative and our partnership with the Department of Human Resources, and I had the opportunity to sit in on one of the initial meetings, and what stood out with me most was the director shared that upon award of the grant, that the language that he incorporated in the uh, grant uh, proposal uh, stating that he would partner with public health was the determining factor in the award. And I thought that spoke volumes to uh, the excellent uh, care and services public health has shared uh, to the citizens of Alabama, and we want to continue on in that vein in providing excellent care coordination services to the children across our state. So before I turn it over to uh, Ms. Godwin, I do want to give you some back history in the development of the grant and also provide you with today's objectives. So today we want to describe the role of the ADPH care coordinator and we want to identify the focus areas within the assessment process and we want to understand the new policies related to clients referred through the EHS grant. So the Department of Human Resources Early Head Start Child Care Partnership received an award from the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services totaling $41 million. And this is a $8.3 million a year over a five-year span. We will serve 566 children using the Early Head Start model. This model has established partnerships between Head Start programs and licensed child care centers and a statewide family child care hub. These partnerships are with Alabama Department of Children's Affairs, the Alabama Department of Public Health, Auburn University, and Alabama Department of Post-Secondary Member Schools. The purpose of the DHR Early Head Start Grant Program is to serve children eligible already children already receiving child care subsidies. The priority need are teen mothers and families challenged by homelessness, child abuse, and neglect issues. This is a statewide effort and it will include urban and rural counties where there is a high number of children experiencing poverty. We will provide the early learning and medical care needed to prepare our children to enter public school. The counties in the Head Start centers are located and identified based on the grant specified risk factors and those counties include DeKalb, Talladega, Houston, Randolph, Marshall, Mobile, Limestone, Jefferson and Madison counties. Counties in which both family daycare homes and Head Start centers are located and identified based on the same risk factors include Kaneka, Dallas, Escambia, Lowndes, Marengo, Marion, Green, Jefferson, Lauderdale, Mobile, Montgomery, and Sumter counties. And Sean, I just wanted to stop for just a minute. 
just a second and mention just because your county may not be listed right now, the family child care homes that we have with this project, those children can rotate in and out of those. So it's possible that you may not have a child in your county right now that's involved in the grant, but maybe next year a child would come onto the grant that is in your county. So just because your county's not listed right now doesn't mean you won't ever have a child in your county that's involved in the grant. Thank you. So who's eligible for the program? The EHS grant extends eligibility to children ages six weeks old through four years of age in counties throughout the state participating in the grant program, and also to children already receiving child care subsidies. So right now I want to turn it over to uh, Ms. Godwin. Uh, she's going to delve uh, further into the mechanics of the program and how we're going to implement our care coordination program. And I also want to remind you that at the end of this training, you will be provided a link uh, to a quiz in LCMS. You'll, provide that, you'll be provided that link later on today. Ms. Godwin. Thank you, Sean. Uh, good morning. And we are so excited about this wonderful opportunity. And um, I wanted just to talk a little bit about the payment structure um, with this program, we are not billing Medicaid. Care coordination services are going to be, be billed directly to DHR each month. Um, the Alabama Department of Human Resources is going to provide care coordination reports and follow-up data on all client referrals and services rendered. We are able to do 10 hours of care coordination for each enrolled child during the program year. And we, like, uh, the, we're doing that based on 566 children. Right now, as of today, we only have 516 children. But I'm going to, as we get more into this program, I'm going to talk a little bit more about uh, managing the time and um, different things like that. The role of the care coordinator, <clears throat> we want to help to ensure that the referred child has an EPSDT screening completed at all required intervals. We want to monitor the child's compliance with well child appointments and EPSD, EPSDT appointments with the primary medical provider. We want to assess the child's needs for a dental home and educate and assist in accessing dental services and monitor compliance with treatment. Another role that the care coordinator has is to assess if the child and or the family have any other needs and link, and link the family to those needed resources. For example, the family may be having a really difficult time, the dad's lost their job, it may be that you need to um, help to educate the family on how to apply for WIC or SNAP or TANF um, or accessing, accessing the local food bank in your area. Um, there may be a sibling who doesn't have health insurance and needs, um, needs an appointment quickly to see a doctor, and you might have to educate them about the, um, an FQHC in their area. How the program is going to work in regard to care coordination, the early Head Start referrals are going to come through the care coordination referral system, just like the other, the PMPs and um, the other uh, children's hospital, very similar to those referrals. Um, the area social work manager and director, they, they should assign these referrals to the care coordinators within five calendar days of receiving the referral. The electronic referral should be entered in ACORN within 10 calendar days of the referral date assigned to the care coordinator. The care coordinator should make contact with the family to schedule an appointment with the child's caregiver and guardian. Phone interviews. If a child's guardian is unable to meet with the care coordinator, you can schedule a phone interview to complete the psychosocial assessment and case plan. During the initial face-to-face -face visit meeting with the parent slash guardian, you're going to need to review the release of information forms, the CHR 3 and the CHR 6A. You want to obtain the parent's signature on the top and the bottom portion of the 6A, authorizing the release of both written and verbal patient information to other individuals and providers. Providers may include but are not limited to the following. Uh, the child's health care, local health care providers, local Head Start staff, the Alabama DHR Child Care Division, um, the grant administrator, 
there may, there's some community partners involved. The more that you get into this, uh, you will um, be, begin communicating with folks in the local Head Start Center, and you'll want to make sure that you've included that you include their name on the release forms. Just a reminder that all releases are to be signed and updated by the parent annually. And this document was going to be, is going to be posted on the document library um, and is also included in the handouts, but I've highlighted through the, um, this is an example of the 6A, where just to make sure that there's no question of which areas need to be completed, and you'll see in the top right hand section, there's, um, you'll want to make sure that you list um, the providers that you are releasing that information to, such as the Alabama Department of Human Resources Child Care, Child Care Division. Is face-to-face -face contact required? Face-to-face -face contact is not required for these cases, but we do recommend face-to-face uh, -face contact uh, just um, to... Um, really get a truer, uh, a better assessment of um, how that child and family are, how they're actually doing. Uh, oftentimes I find that if you meet face to face, you're really able, it's just better practice. And um, the family may be willing to share a little bit more information when, when they're actually meeting with you. Um, and if you're not meeting with the, um, with the client's caregiver face to face, then you run into the issue of where, um, when and how you're going to get your three and your six forms signed. You've got some other options, and these are just a few examples. There are a variety of ways to achieve getting um, the release form signed, but you can mail your uh, release forms to the parent and ask them to um, to drop them off to you or to mail them back to you. Um, you can contact the local Early Head Start um, contact person and request assistance in getting the form signed by the parent. One thing that you will want, if you end up doing this method, you want to make sure that you explain to the uh, Head Start staff what you're wanting. They are not familiar with these forms at all. That's part of the reason why I highlighted um, the release form. Um, you just want to make sure that they understand because they, they know that you're going to contact them, but they don't know specifically you know, the questions that you may ask. So if you want, if you need their help in getting um, signatures on the forms, then you just want to make sure that you have a conversation. Meredith and I talked a little bit about this, and we discussed how, you know, you could see where you'd make a phone call to the uh, parent and say, hey, I am um, wanted to, after you've, you know, told them who you are and what you're doing, you know, just to say, I'd love to meet you over at the Head Start Center when you're picking your child up. And then from there, you'd be able to meet the Head Start person and you'd be able to meet the child as well as the parent, get the form signed. You'd be able to explain to, um, the, to both the parent and to the um, Head Start person exactly what you're doing there and why, you know, the services that we're going to be providing. Um, you know, the other option is if you've got, if you've got a family who, they um, receive WIC, and they're going to be coming into the health department. You can leave the, you know, make an arrangement, and leave the releases up front at the front desk, and um, and then you know the parent can sign them there. Um, <clears throat> I want to talk a little bit about protocol timeframes, and um, just to go over that, this information is is spelled out in the protocol as well. But as I said earlier, we want to assign the referrals to the care coordinator within five calendar days of receiving the referral through CCRS. We want to enter the electronic referral form in ACORN within 10 calendar days of receiving the referral. We want to attempt contact with the child's caregiver within 10 calendar days of receiving the referral as well. The psychosocial that must be completed needs to be completed within 30 calendar days of making the initial contact with the family. You also want to complete that case plan as well within the 30 calendar days of making the initial contact with the family. Um, the ACORN, we have made the changes in ACORN. Um, we have completed testing it. There are a couple of edits that are being made. Um, we hope to uh, get that in, 
we hope to be sending out an email shortly to tell you, hey, go online and, or go into ACORN and you'll be able to see these forms. But what you'll do is you'll go in and you'll select, and you, when you select the program, um, you will go in and you'll select uh, DHR, you'll of course select your name and then DHR as the um, program. And then you would enter your referral date. And then you would um, just put in, just as you do all the other referrals, you would put in the patient information. Uh, it's very important. Referring provider is extremely important because you want to make sure that you complete the referral source section correctly because this is what, as, as everyone knows, this is what, um, how we um, trigger their um, report to the referring provider. So you want to make sure that you select the Department of Human Resources Early Head Start as the referral source. And um, Myra Lamar is the contact person who will be on the referral source. This information is going to pre-populate in the, in the provider report, so you won't have to worry as much about that as long as you select the Early Head Start grant. When you select the Early Head Start grant, when you um, go in, you select DHR, <coughs> and um, then you will see a drop-down box or actually a list of all the center sites, and you will choose the center site that your child is attending. Um, and, we'll, and you just put a, a, a check mark by that center site. Now, if the child is attending what's called a family daycare home, that is Auburn University. That's the very first one, and I realize these slides are t probably too small for you guys to see, but that's the very first one. And if it, it, it is a daycare home, which is real obvious from the list of um, center sites, which is a document that is in the um, handouts that will be on the document library. And if I'm not mistaken, that information has also been posted to um, the presentation as well today. So with Auburn uh, University is the very first one in the family daycare homes. We have there about, I think around 200 children who are in these daycare homes. Um, so you'll just want to um, take a look at the list and you'll see where your child is. Our goal is that when the referral comes through CCRS in the additional comments section or in another section of the referral in CCRS, we will actually have the child's center site uh, in that referral information. So it will be really easy for you guys to fill out your referral form in ACORN. <coughs> We're de developing our case plan within uh, 30 days of um, making contact with the family. We want to review the psychosocial assessment and the case plan with the caregiver six calendar months from the date of the initial case plan. Um, when we were creating this protocol, we tried to make it um, just like the, uh, similar to the other um, types of referrals in the protocol so you wouldn't have to learn a whole new set of time, time frames and that type thing. So that is something that we have tried to just mirror <coughs> those um, dates for other referral types. Of course, you want to update your case plan as needed. Um, and for example, let's say that um, you're working with a family. It happens that, um, that the family has to move because there's a fire. And so that's something that, yes, it's pretty significant, and you'd want to make sure that you update that case plan if there's something that needs to be addressed related to that significant event in the family's life. You want to make sure that you also complete a new case plan each year. Um, the psychosocial assessment is just like the psychosocial assessment with all the other referral types that we do. You're just going to go in, you're going to complete that information, and... Um, you will go in and, and make your notes where they need to be. You don't have to complete the entire document. Um, <clears throat> you know, it, it of course will allow you to save without every um, issue being bubbled in. Um, and with the psychosocial case plan, we, when you've selected DHR, Early Head Start referral as your referral source uh, or your referral type, then you're going to have um, <clears throat> A case plan that will pop in and you will see and it's basically going to it states that 
about uh, EPSDT compliance, well child visits, and uh, providing a dental link in the family to dental services, and if the child's been compliant with dental visits. And Melissa, I noticed when I reviewed this in ACORN, I, the first time I read it, I actually had marked that there were some changes that need to be made. Uh, but then when I kept reading, I realized what the difference was. You're going to notice that your problem and your goal are the same for several of the options. Well, that's because the intervention is different. So your problem and goal are going to be the same, but the intervention is going to be different. So when you look at it the first time, you might go, well, they put the same problem and goal in there. Yes, we did. It's the intervention that changes. So you'll have to read it all the way across the line to see that the intervention is what changes on that sometimes. Thank you, Meredith. And we've also included um, on the case plan, you've got a couple of blank spaces if there's something that's not something in particular that's going on with that family that needs to be addressed in the case plan, we have that. Uh, you have that availability there, so you can provide that additional information. Because um, we do, we want, um, even though there are only four things that we are uh, required to follow in regard to providing the care, care coordination services, <clears throat> we know that you all want to provide um, the best uh, services that you can provide using good social work practice and any you know any time that you identify that there's a need that needs to be addressed that you know that we want you to have the ability to put that information into the case plan <clears throat> with the report to referring provider we um, we ask that you complete the report to referring provider within the first 30 calendar days of preceding the initial referral Subsequent reports to the referring provider will be submitted every um, 90 calendar days, which begins from the date of the last report of the referring provider. Now, if any time during this um, time that you're working with the family, if there's something significant that occurs, you want to make sure that you um, submit a provider report so the um, provider is aware of what's going on. A uh, report should be sent sooner, like I said, if, it's a, if a significant event occurs. For example, if the patient has an EPSDT screening appointment coming up and, and they kept their appointment on, August, on October the 31st and you contacted the doctor's office, you confirmed that the appointment was kept, then you would want to submit a provider report indicating that you received that information. Um, if you happen to speak with the parent at that right around that same time and she confirmed that she was having transportation issues and you educated her about how to use MedNet transportation services, for example, you would want to include that information on your provider report as well. <clears throat> All of the information entered on the report to referring provider are going to be dumped into a spreadsheet. This data is going to be supplied back to the Alabama Department of Human Resources. So they aren't going to fax that? No, no ma'am. They are not going to fax that report. You will not have to do that. You, all that information is, like I said, is going to be dumped into the, um, dumped into a spreadsheet, which here at the central office, we, we handle getting that information to them. But in a few minutes, I'm going to talk a little bit about um, something that you will be required to do, which is sending something to um, our office. So they do not need to print out the provider report and fax it? No, they do not need to print out the provider report and fax it. It's going to dump into a spreadsheet. So they will not need to, the re provider report does not need to be sent anywhere. It's all going to drop into that spreadsheet so that you don't have to do anything. Once you complete it, and make sure you click that Save button, once you click Save, you don't have to do anything else. It's going to drop into a spreadsheet, and you do not have to send it anywhere. Right. And um, again, I would just like to stress the importance of when you are selecting your referral type, um, it's, it is extremely important that you select DHR Early Head Start because this is what triggers your report to your referring provider. Um, it's your referring provider. The referring provider, when you click DHR, is what triggers it to go straight yes. to that spreadsheet. Yes. Um, all right, so the report to referring provider, the information, I said this a few minutes ago, but it's actually going to um, our contact person at DHR who's going to be getting the spreadsheet. Her name is Myra Lamar, 
and um, the because you select um, DHR early head start her information is going to pre-populate into that form so you don't have to worry about typing that in as soon as you select DHR early head start that information pre-populates into the form itself um, <clears throat> And to me, this is a really cool report to referring provider. It's um, <clears throat> when you um, start entering the report um, information, you're going to get some questions. For example, was the care coordinator able to locate the patient? You bubble in yes. Then it drops down, did the patient accept services? Yes. Does your child have a primary medical provider? Yes. Then, if you because you select yes, what happens next is you will see name of the primary medical provider. You will put that information in, and if it's a group, for example, you'll it's going to sound um, kind of crazy, but if it's a group, let's say if it's pediatric associates, then um, you will um, there's there's a choice when you say primary when you read the question primary medical provider type. You can select individual or group. If you select group, then of course you'll put pediatric associates, for example. Um, after you put in the provider information, what you will then do is you will put in the date of the last appointment with the primary medical provider. And then there's a question of did the patient keep the scheduled appointment? Yes, no. You, there's a question about is the child's uh, EPSDT current? Yes or no. And then if you say, um, then there's a question of date of the last EPSDT. There's a calendar box that you and you select the date. Um, has there been a well-child visit since the last report to the referring provider? Of course, you would get, if you say no, then, um, then you're through with that section. Does the child have a dental home? Yes, the child has a dental home. Or if you select no, then you're going to get a question about the patient requests assistance in helping to locate a dental home. Um, then were there any updates to the psychosocial assessment since the last report? Now, that sounds kind of a, like a crazy question because, hey, you just got this case. You've not seen a report. But um, we tried to figure out the best way to do this because what happens is when you when you get to this question on the provider report, were there any updates to the psychosocial assessment since the last report? Even if it's your initial report, you're doing a new report to them, so you want to select yes. As soon as you select yes, what will happen is you're going to get a pop-up box that reminds you, send updated copy of the psychosocial assessment to the Family Health Services Central Office. We have to provide all of that information to the Department of Human Resources. They're actually, so we're going to send them a copy of your updated assessment. Um, so that is a piece of information that uh, I will need. So when you, when you get that pop-up and it tells you and, it, and you say yes, you want to make sure that you email me or fax me a copy of the updated assessment. Um, so I can get that information to them. And we're also that's going to be part of our quality um, assurance process as well. We're going to be going, going in and reviewing the documents that are being submitted. If there are areas that, are doing, that you're doing great, and fantastic, and wonderful, we're going to give you those accolades back to your manager and director and let them know, you know what a fantastic job you're doing. If there are areas that need improvement, um, then we will also give that information um, to the director and manager as well. We realize this is a new program and no one's perfect and it's all a learning process. So as you're going through this, there'll be things that um, that you may, your first few cases that you do, you may, um, you may do it one way and then as you're getting them more referrals, you're like, oh, I think I'll make sure I mention this in the assessment because it fits better um, as you've gotten a little bit more acclimated to working this type of referral. Now, I want to back up a minute to the psychosocial assessment that we're asking you to send in to the central office. There's a couple of ways that you can do that. Uh, you can easily, you can just shoot an email to Melissa that says, hey, I updated the assessment and give her the patient's name and she can go and pull it from ACORN. Not a problem. That will work just fine. 
There's another way you can do it. When you're in the patient's record, after you have completed that assessment, you can go up to the actions in the toolbar up at the top. You can select actions and click forward. And it'll drop it straight to an email and that document will then automatically email straight to Melissa. The other way is you're always welcome to print it out and fax it up here to her. Not a problem. You can pick which way you do it. It doesn't matter to us how it comes in. And if sending an email just saying, hey, Joe Smo's assessment has been updated, we can go and pull that and pull it out of the record. That is not a problem. I also wanted to mention something about the EPSDT on the, the report to referring provider. This was a discussion we had late Friday afternoon. Not all of these children are going to have Medicaid, which means if they don't have Medicaid, they're not required to have that EPSDT. They're still going to have their well-child appointments, but they may not know what an EPSDT is because if they're not on Medicaid, that's not a requirement. So we're going to be adding an NA box to that, that question on the report to referring provider so that if they're not on Medicaid, you can just select NA for that question. So, Thank you, Mary. And in regard to submitting that information, we want you to do what's easiest for you guys. Y'all have enough work on you and, no, and we realize that. So if you, I can go into ACORN and get that report. At, and if you're going to send me an email, you can just put it in the subject line, EHS update, and tell me the patient's name. Whatever's the easiest for you guys to get that information so I know which record um, that I need to pull the information from. I have a couple of slides just about progress notes to just give you um, just some examples of which you all know this because you, many of you have been doing this job for um, quite a, for a very long time and so but basically I wanted to provide you just some examples of some progress notes you know ses successful telephone contact that you a letter mailed and um, you may write in a real brief note that says the care coordinator completed the phone assessment with the patient's mother um, you know your progress note could be something like a patient's a three-year-old black female residing in the home with her mother and eight-year-old brother the care coordinator educated the mother of importance of keeping the EPSDT appointments. The mother explained that the reason for missed appointments was due to transportation issues. The mother has scheduled a follow-up appointment with the patient's PMP for September 22nd at 11.30 a.m. and has arranged for a neighbor to take her and her patient to the appointment. You know, these to me are really good notes because it's... Um, and these are notes that we see in ACORN now under other referral types, you know. So, when, you know, it just gives information uh, where um, the patient's guardian has empowered themselves or, or figured out how to meet their own goal um, or figure out how to s resolve their problem. And, um, you know, it just it, to me it documents, it really shows how the care coordinator has helped um, the patient's guardian to uh, resolve issues throughout um, the, the time, the duration of care that you provided services. The care coordinator provided education on net voucher program and offered assistance with the initial application. Um, some, another, some other examples are patient's mother was very appreciative for the assistance and uh, care coordinator verified Medicaid eligibility to ensure eligibility for the net voucher program. One thing that since we aren't billing Medicaid with these, we do want to make sure, yes, there is not a requirement um, that you check Medicaid to verify eligibility, but as we know, if they go to the doctor and they don't have Medicaid, they're going to have a problem. So you would want to uh, continue to include checking Medicaid as a part of the process when you're working these referral types because that's going to help you to identify with that family problems and um, issues that need to be resolved. Um, CC also offered care management services for the patient's sibling. One thing that um, DHR has requested was that if we provided, and this is a question on the provider report as well, if, if we provided uh, services to a sibling. So let's say that you're talking to a family and you've got a sibling who's got some, some pretty serious health issues and the mom and the dad are stressed about that and, and the child's, she's fearful the child's going to lose Medicaid and that type thing. 
Well, if you just if that's the case, for example, what you want to do is you want to go and you want to open a case on that sibling, and that would be another case that you would work. Um, that would and that would be a case in which you would bill Medicaid for. So this is going to be a great way to um, actually get other referrals out of um, this one referral type. So if you have two or three siblings in the home, and let's say that those three siblings have lost their Medicaid, you, and you've got to help the mom and dad to um, get their Medicaid reinstated, then you would want to uh, do an electronic referral in ACORN uh, about um, indicating it's a, a self-referral and indicating that you know the need for services, and then you would just um, work that cases, work those cases as well. Um, if at any point the mother declines services or the dad declines services for the other child, you would want to indicate that. If the if you if you get a sense that the sibling is needs your services or could benefit from your services, but you just hadn't got mom and dad or dad on board yet about care coordination services, this would be a great um, note for you to include that the mom declined the services for the other child at this time. It at least recognizes, it shows that you recognize that there's an issue with the sibling and that you want to provide services, uh, but the mom's just not quite there yet. And another thing you could offer to the family when you talk with them is it could be that mom might be eligible for Plan First services. Maybe she's not on full Medicaid, but you could offer her those Plan First services and you could complete a risk assessment with her and try to get her in for her family planning needs as well. So just think about what other things you could offer to the family when you make contact with them through this grant. Any other referrals that you make through this grant, you are not going to code to DHR, though. You'll need to code that to the specific program that you've referred that patient to for the other services that you've come up with, that you've identified. With progress notes, um, know that some other examples are will follow up as required to ensure appointments are kept. Um, the service type other. Um, Care coordinator travel to the local EHS center to pick up sign release forms. One thing that in talking with, we actually had a conference call with all of the um, early Head Start staff, the contact people in each center, and they were um, they had some questions about, hey, well, you know, what are these people doing? You know, care coordination. We, we follow a lot of these people. A lot of these children, anyway, knowing we have to keep up with when their EPSDT screening is done, or if they have a, a dentist and that type thing. What we wanted, what we want to do, and what we tried to explain to them is, we're partnering with them. We want to collaborate with the Early Head Start folks, so we can help this child be all that he can be, is, you know, and and help him to achieve um, the goals um, that that. He, he, that his parents have for him or that may be in the child's best interest. Um, and so if you're going to the, um, to the local Head Start Center to pick up forms, that's a great opportunity for you to just take a minute and, and educate that particular um, local contact about the different services that you provide. We aren't in there step, trying to step on their territory and get all in their business. We're there just to be a support to them because Everybody has um, so much to do, and we want to make sure that we are, if, it's our goal there is to make sure that the kids are getting to the doctor and that they have a dental home. We want to make sure we address those goals. And if there's anything that you might see that could be affecting their performance um, or their attendance at the head, at, in the Head Start program, we want, to, um, we want to make sure we're having a discussion with that um, Head Start staff just saying, you know, this is what mom's saying. The child's having some problems, uh, you know, paying attention at home and following through with certain things. And we just want to make sure that, that, that there's some good communication there between the two, between you and the early Head Start, so they understand and they see what our role is, is there to help them um, as well as the child. They'll we are not there to, for example, this is this is a specific example that was discussed. Let's say that the child goes to the doctor and the doctor's changed formulas. 
and the parent tells you the child's doctor changed the formula and um, they've gotten a prescription and that kind of thing and you note all that information in your notes. You want to make sure that you tell the parent, hey, you need to make sure you give that copy of that prescription to the Early Head Start Center so they have it for their documentation there so they will know what the what formula the child's on, for example. Um, your role is not to take that copy of that prescription and provide it to the um, Head Start person. That is, that's the parent's job. But you want to make sure that the Head Start Center, you might, that's when you might want to pick up the phone and give a call to the Head Start Center and talk to that person or send an email, you know, once you've gotten to know the, the local Head Start person and just say, hey, I met with Jane Smith today and, uh, the baby's formula was changed to so and so. The mom has told me she's going to bring in, uh, the copy of the prescription so you'll have it for your files there. That is one specific thing that they wanted to make sure, a specific example that, um, that they mentioned. Um, we just don't want there to be any confusion of, you know, with the parent and who they're supposed to provide information to. Um, some other examples of notes, like a progress note, service type other. Um, care coordinator met with the Early Head Start worker to review the ADPH release of information forms, three and the six, and requested obtaining um, help with uh, obtaining the mom's signature. Um, successful telephone contact. New Early Head Start referral received on this day to address missed EPSD2 screening, education and assistance with community resources. This is another example of a progress note that you would, you know, if you're, um, as you're noting about a successful telephone contact. And one thing too to remember, when you're talking with these families, I don't know, um, <clears throat> sometimes um, when you mention DHR, our families freak out, just to be quite honest with you, um, and they're like, no, we don't want services. DA there's nothing wrong with my child, and, yeah, you know, they're, I think some of our families become concerned that their children are going to be removed from the home because DHR is involved. So, um, and DHR uh, and the Head Start Centers, we talk with them about this. Um, the, the Head Start Centers had some concerns as well, and so um, we want the focus to be around Early Head Start. This is an Early Head Start grant. Don't let, you know, don't go in there and, and say DHR, DHR, DHR. You want to really let the focus be. It's an Early Head Start program. We've partnered with the Early Head Start Center, you know, and it's the Child Care Division of Human Resources. So you want to try to do your best to let that focus be Early Head Start because we don't want to get the family so worked up because they think DHR is involved in their case. Um, of course, you're getting, with progress notes, for example, another example is um, how you reviewed information and updated Falcon, or you entered uh, patient's information into ACORN. The care coordinator made contact with the patient's mom to explain reason for referral and to educate her concerning care coordination services. Let's see, the care coordinator offered, educated, offered and educated the caregiver on our release of information forms and offered to schedule a face-to-face -face visit at the health department. You know, when you're scheduling these visits with the families, I know you're going to do what's most convenient for the family. And, you know, another great option for you is to, if, if they're coming in for other services, then, you know, take, see if you can schedule an appointment with them when they're coming in for other services at the local health department. Some other examples of notes are um, the, caregiver, un the um, <clears throat> caregiver unable to complete the interview at the health department but lives within walking distance of the Early Head Start Center. Um, that, and CC will phone the caregiver next week for a phone interview and we'll hand carry the release of information forms to the Head Start Center to request that the parent sign the documents as soon as possible. You know, I was thinking about as, as we were working through these different examples and thinking about how I would do it if it were my case. You know, I would call the parent, I would think, and I'd just have a conversation with them. And um, if I wasn't able to meet that parent at the Head Start Center, then, and, I, and the plan was for me to actually um, 
take the releases over to the Head Start Center and leave them, then I'd then pick up the phone and I'd call the, the early Head Start contact person and say, hey, I've talked with Jane Smith. She's going to be picking up Johnny this afternoon, and I wanted to bring these release forms over or fax them over to you. Um, and I've indicated the sections that need to be signed. Uh, would you mind getting her to sign them and then maybe fax the forms back? And, you know, maybe once she receives them that um, at the Head Start Center, if you're going to fax them, touch base with her, see if she has any questions. Because, um, yes, you've explained to the parent on the phone about the release of information. But once they actually see that release and they see what they're signing, there may be some other questions. And it's really not the place of the Head Start Center to try to figure out about our releases. You just want to make sure that the local uh, Head Start person doesn't have any questions. And I think that the um, more you collaborate with your local Head Start and the more contact you have, then it's going to put the Head Start staff more at ease about you know, getting forms and things like that signed when you need their assistance. Patient contact requirements. The care coordinator is to have at least one successful phone contact or face-to-face -face encounter with the child's parent, guardian, per quarter. That's every 90 calendar days, which begins from the date of the last successful contact. So, <clears throat> again, you're, the care coordinator should have at least one successful phone contact or face-to-face -face encounter with the child's parent per 90 calendar days. Um, of course, you can have unlimited phone contact um, and you want to mail appointment reminders. And when you're doing that significant contact, I was thinking about that this morning and <clears throat> trying to think, okay, a provider report, you want to submit a provider report when there's a significant contact. All right, you happen to run into, you're walking to your office and you're walking through the front lobby of the health department and you happen to run into one of the referrals, one of your EHS referrals in the lobby. They're there getting wick for their sibling. Well, so you happen to say hello and that's all, you know, how, how are you doing, that kind of thing. Well, that's really not a successful um face-to-face -face contact. That's not really meaningful. And so you want to make sure that when you're talking, when you're, when you're noting these uh, significant contacts or these successful contacts, that, that there's something um, of substance, that you've had a conversation with the parent about the child's upcoming EPSDT appointment or the well child visits or what's going on at home that's preventing the mom from being able to get the child there. You just want to make sure that um, that in that provider that refer uh, excuse me that report to referring provider uh, or in your progress notes that you are you know making sure that you've got that um, meaningful information there. How long is the case going to remain open? Well, um, all. Um, early Head Start referrals will remain open for the length of time that the child is enrolled in the program. So this program covers from six weeks of age, it could be possibly up until five years of age, depending on where the referral, if the child is placed in a family daycare home, there is potential for that child to be followed after the age of four years. So you just want to make, you just be aware that this may be your case for the next three years, depending on the child's age. And as long as he's enrolled in the Head Start program, is, and as long as they're willing to accept services, is how long it will, will, will remain open. If the child moves to a different county and is going to be starting a new Head Start center, then, of course, that would be a case transfer. And... Um, should that happen, then um, you just want to transfer that case and then um, a new care coordinator in the county where the child is living would begin following the case. For the SSR coding with the Early Head Start referrals, the service code is 45 and activity type 4. Um, and then you would put in your minutes and that you... Um, for that particular event, and we'll be running reports off of this SSR billing, so so we'll be able to provide um, a monthly invoice to the Department of Human Resources. 
And Melissa, I noticed that there is only one SSR code, and that's because we're only providing services to children. So we only needed the one code. You'll notice there's not a separate code for adults because we don't serve adults through this program. There's just one service code, the service area. There's only one because there's we're only providing services to those children. So it's going to be a 45. Amount of time allotted for care coordination services per enrolled child. I mentioned this earlier. We get 10 hours of care coordination for each enrolled child during the program year. Um, if the child needs more assistance during the year, additional time can be billed as long as the total billing does not exceed 5,660 hours for the entire state. And there's no way that you guys are going to know what the other people are doing, what the other care coordinators are doing, so I'll be managing that from up here as well. Yes, you need to keep an eye on how much time you are providing your, ch your children, your EHS children yourselves per month, but um, as as we move forward with this grant and this project, what will happen is I will begin monitoring that time. And if I start seeing where you're approaching that 10 hours and there's only, you know, you've got, um, you know, six more months, for example, left, well, you're clearly going to exceed your 10 hours. So um, that's when um, I'll be contacting you and letting you know just to make you aware. And then if we need, at that point, I'd be, I would be helping to figure out what we can do about getting you some additional time for that particular child given their, given their circumstance. And that's where the importance of your documentation is going to come into play. If, um, if that information is documented real, very clearly about what's going on with the case, it'll be pretty easy for me to figure out why you need that additional time, which in the long run, which in the long run will save the care coordinator time because then I won't have a lot of questions for you about why you need that time. Um, just a reminder that the purpose of the Early Head Start program is to ensure the patient has a primary medical provider slash medical home. We want to make sure that the EPSDT and the well child appointments are kept. We want to ensure that the patient is established with a dental home. And we want to assess the child and her family for any additional needs and link the family to needed resources. I think that's all the slides that I had, but are there any questions? We're going to give you all a minute to think about this for a little bit, and if you've got some questions, please do not hesitate to call us or email us. We're sitting right here waiting for your questions if you have any. And while we're doing that, I want to back up and talk about the billing for just a minute. Um, Melissa did a really good job of explaining how that works. Uh, and I've had to give several presentations on this grant, and one time when I was describing it, I kind of explained it as it's a pool. We have a pool of 5,660 hours. So if Melissa has a patient and I have a patient, let's say that Melissa only spends five hours with her patient and I spent 15 with mine. Well, that makes a total of 20, so we're still okay. We haven't exceeded the limit in our pool. We haven't used any of the extra water that's in there. So as long as we stay within that 5,660 hours for everybody, then we're okay. I foresee that with your infants, you're going to be spending a lot more time with the infants. They've got well child appointments at what well, I think it's at one month, three months, six months, and um, I think maybe at nine months. So they have multiple well child appointments when they're an infant. So when you've got the infants, you're probably going to spend more time with them. But let's say you also have a four year old on your caseload. Well, they just have that one well child appointment during the year. And then we want you to make sure they're getting in with the dentist. So they'll have that, the Regular checkup in this, at six months, they'll have that other dental checkup. So it's possible that with like a four-year-old, you may only have three appointments that you have to track with that patient. So in those cases, you're not going to spend near the same amount of time with your four-year-old that you would with your infant. So we're thinking the hours might balance out a little bit depending on what type of child you have in the program. So you don't have to worry too much about your hours. Melissa and I are going to work on tracking that for you, and we can monitor it on a whole. 
So even if you're starting to go over your 10 hours, Melissa's going to communicate that with you. But hopefully there's going to be another case manager somewhere else that isn't spending as much time on a patient, and it's going to balance that out. So we're hoping that that's going to work out for you. Um, the other thing that I wanted to mention is Melissa did an excellent job of letting you know, hey, there are people in the Head Start Center that are working with these children too. There are health care coordinators within the, the early Head Start Centers that are doing s similar things that we're doing as well. So we're there to help them, and we are not there to step on their toes. We are not there to take their jobs. They're, they're very concerned that we're kind of duplicating what they're doing, but we're there to provide further assistance because they're focusing on all of those children in that Head Start Center, and we're just going to be focusing on a small number. And what our hope is is that we're going to get in there and do such a bang-up good job for them that they're going to see, oh, y'all can do a lot of great stuff for us. Can we refer other children to you? Sure can, as long as they have Medicaid. So if they have Medicaid, the other children in the daycare center, we're happy to provide services to them as well. And we have our first question that has come in. Um, at what age do we need to start monitoring the establishment of a dental home? Obviously, a six-week-old a six is not going to be seeing a dentist. So at what age do we start monitoring for the establishment of a dental home? That is a great question. And um, <clears throat> I spoke with Sherry Good in our office, we were discussing this piece a little bit, and um, if I recall, and I'm going to go, go back and verify and make sure that I'm recalling this correctly, I want to say that after a year of age that we want to um, have that dental home. Um, so I want to say it's a year, but let me double check that, and I can send something out confirming that date, um, um, that time as well. Um, so I want to say it's at a year. And if we remember from our patient first training, we have a, a there's actually one of those on demand. Um, it's a saddle, it's the the web version training of the dental first look program. And what the dental first look program does through patient first is the pediatrician is applying those fluoride varnishes to the infant, and then around age one is when we want to start trying to get them involved in that dental home. So I, I think Melissa's right around um, age one is what we're probably going to send out and confirm for you, but we do just want to double check that date, but pretty sure it's around year one that you want to start trying to get that child established with the dental home. And what... One of the um, <clears throat> documents that is attached to um, the information about the training this morning and will be on the document library is a uh, what we're calling a guidance tool, which is different than a protocol. It gives a little bit more information, just some suggestions and that type thing. And I think that that's a great um, question that we had, and I will add that to the actual guidance tool because I think that's um, something that um, we, we just don't know off the top of our head. So... I will make sure that we put that into the guidance tool as well. Uh, Melissa has now referenced the, the guidance tool. What we've decided to do is you're going to have a protocol. We're going to give you a protocol, and we try to make it um, very clear and very clean cut. Uh, it's, it's, we've got you some general information at the beginning, and then it's step one, two, three, four, just very simple steps. But there were questions when Melissa and I were discussing. I was like, well, what about this? Well, what about this? So we decided to develop a guidance tool. And the guidance is there to try and answer some of those questions that protocol may be generating, but that we didn't necessarily want to put in black and white in protocol. Because, you know, once it's in protocol, then you're held to that standard. So just like with the face-to-face -face encounters, I would love to put into protocol that you're required to do a face-to-face. -face. But... It's not DHR is saying you don't have to do it face-to-face. -face. So we've put that in the guidance. We would like for you to do a face-to-face, -face, but it's not going to be a requirement with, with these referral types. So the guidance tool is there to try and help you to understand protocol a little bit better. So we hope that, that you're going to like that and that that's going to be beneficial to you. We've gotten another question. Um, when can we expect to start receiving referrals? Well, we hope that... Um we, that you'll begin to start seeing those referrals um, the first of next week. Um, 
we're going, we're trying to work out the kinks about getting that information imported into CCRS because we um, would really like to see if you're able to start making contact next week uh, prior to the end of October. We would love to see that. Um, so that's our goal um, is next week. Uh, like I mentioned during the training, uh, there were a couple little tweaks to ACORN that we want to make. We want to add that NA box beside the EPSDT. So we want to have ACORN uh, polished and ready to go before we start sending referrals out to you. So we've tested the form, and we think we found all the little kinks that we need to get worked out of it so that we are just about ready to go live with ACORN. But we are still trying to figure out how to get the data from the information that DHR has provided to us into CCRS. We think that's going to be the easiest way to get the information out to you is through CCRS. And right now, the format that we have isn't going to drop into CCRS. So we're trying to work on that as well so that it can be as smooth as possible once it is sent out to you. So we're hoping to, to get that taken care of as soon as we can. Um, and uh, hopefully next week is, is our plan. So that's gonna, what's the date next Monday? Um, well, now that's the 26th. So we're looking at Monday, October the 26th, 2015 is what we're thinking right now. Uh, but we do want to make sure that everything is good to go before we send that. We're going to send you emails and communicate with you via email so that you'll know when to expect those. We'll try to give you a heads up. If we're ready to go on Monday, we'll send you something out on Friday and say, okay, let me know. It's probably going to start coming to you on Monday. And I'm, I'm going to receive, and I may have already received it, but I'm going to receive an updated list from the Department of Human Resources in regard to the uh, participants, the children who are who we're going to see. I've gotten a couple of lists. Um, what every um, once a month, eventually uh, they they will provide me with a list of children who are added to the program, who are dropped off the program for any reason, you know that type thing. But we, um, I had asked for one more list, um, so we could, so we'd be able to know what students, um, okay. uh, what kids would be um, on the program. Uh, we have a phone call from Coleman County with a question. So Coleman County, you can go ahead with your question. Will you please talk in more detail about this DHR six about adding information about different. Uh, entities on one form? Sure, sure I will. For example, um, we are going to provide information to the Alabama Department of Human Resources. The data that's being dropped into the, um, <clears throat> into the spreadsheet. So you would want to do where it says provider, you would want to add the Alabama Department of Human Resources Child Care Division onto your um, six, onto that section um, of the six. And you would just put that information in there, which um, on the document library, there'll be an example for you. You'll just be able to copy right off of that particular item, um, and you'll see that. And so, but it's it's just like you do your other for your other referral types. It's whoever you're um, releasing or require or getting information from from about the child that you would want to include in that section of where it lists out the provider and it's got the blanks for you to fill in their names. And I think you've done an example form. Yes. Um, so would they be able to just print that one off the document library that's kind of pre-populated with that information yes, on there? Yes, they would. Okay. So that would be beneficial yeah. as well. They wouldn't have to figure out how to get it on there. Um, yes. I've seen an example of it. Melissa did a good job of putting in there uh, that information of who that that's going to go to. Because we're sending that provider report and those psychosocial assessments are being sent over to DHR. So we want that. We're having to release that written information. So we wanted that top section of the six to be completed as well as the bottom where they sign. And if you're looking in the document library right now for that form, it's not there. And we FHS, haven't loaded it yet. <laughs> so, but it's going to be loaded this afternoon. All the documents um, will be loaded this afternoon. But I do believe it's one of the examples that was on the training when you registered for the training. It's an, there's an example of the six there as well. Uh, we have another uh, email question. Will we get an email reminder that we have referrals in the CCRS system? Yes. Yes, you'll, you'll be notified of these referrals. And for the managers and directors, um, what I'm going to do is when I look at my list 
my major list, my newest list that I got from DHR. I am going to go ahead and shoot you guys an email out and tell you the number of referrals that DHR referrals for your area and let you know the counties that they're in so you'll have that information. The numbers probably have not changed that much um, from previously when I think I, at the manager and director's meeting I just gave you an estimated um, number of referrals but I will let you know the counties specifically that your referrals are going to be in as well as the um, um, as well as the children's names. So you'll have that information. Uh, my email questions went away, so hopefully they'll come back in just a second. But I um, did want to mention as well that uh, we have made a change in ACORN related to patient first. The face-to-face -face and successful phone call under the service type has been put back into ACORN. So since you're no longer billing to that two and three, you're just billing directly to the four now under the activity type, we've put the successful phone call and face-to-face -face back. So you could be selecting that when you're doing activity type four and patient first as well. Okay. Um, my email questions have come back. So uh, if y'all have any more questions, please don't hesitate to call us or email us. We're still here. We still have some time that we are more than happy to take those questions. And do we have any questions from our audience? I do want to mention one thing is really not a question. But when you're in the home doing the assessment, I, again, you talked about different services to make referrals to, but also look at who else is in the home. If, if, if there's a grandmother there who may need home health or biomonitoring, or if maybe there's a, an older pregnant sibling who may need WIC, just do an assessment of the whole family, not just of the, the early Head Start child. That's a great uh, point. I'm glad you brought that out, Renee, because one of the questions on the uh, ref uh, report to referring provider is, did you is there anyone else in the family uh, that you identified who needed services? And if you select yes, then um, it will give you an option to choose um, to be able to indicate some information specifically. Uh, but again, you'd have to do an electronic referral in ACORN because that would be a different case. Yes, Renee brought up an excellent point. Thank you. Uh, anytime that you're in the home or talking with that family at the Early Head Start Center, just ask if there's anybody else in the family that would possibly need some assistance, and we're more than happy to pick those cases up and start working with it. Please don't forget plan first cases. Uh, you're going to be dealing with some moms, so it's it's very possible that you could run encounter a mom that doesn't have insurance coverage, and plan first would be an excellent option for her. So please don't forget about plan first when you're meeting with the families and, and try to offer those services as well. Try to look at this as an opportunity to... to touch more cases. Uh, we want to try to help as many people as we can and DHR has asked in several of our meetings why aren't you doing this for all of our population? Well start let's let's start the process now with our DHR EHS grant and then hopefully we can show them what a wonderful job we can do and then we'll possibly get more grant funds so we can continue to do this type of work for them. So um, I look at this as a great opportunity to find more cases and to help more people. That's, that's really our goal, is to see how many people we can help and, and try to, to help as many people as possible. So um, do we have any more questions? I'm more than happy to take uh, any phone calls or email questions. Happy to help. And one thing that another point that I've Sean um, talked a little bit about this. I'd just like to say is that when Sean was saying about how um, the case, how DHR decided to include case management and um, in um, their program, and other states are actually looking at Alabama and the work that this care coordination service is being provided, and um, and other states are asking the DHR folks, well. How are y'all doing it? And so it may turn out that other, other Head Start programs throughout the nation may decide to model their case management, if they choose to do a case management piece, may decide to model their um, 
their program based upon what we're doing here. So we we would really appreciate, you know, any feedback of their things that that could be done better or changes to the protocol and that type thing. You know, give us that information so we can do um, we can make those changes. So if other states end up looking at our program, um, you know, then we would, um, I think that'd be some very good information for us to be able to provide as well. Okay. Well, if there are no more uh, phone call questions or email questions, uh, we'll um, get ready to sign off here. I just want to let you know that after today's broadcast, it will be available on demand shortly. We'll send out a link and let you know when it's up. On that on-demand page, we will also have some links to several of the handouts will be posted there as well. We are also going to set up on the document library under FHS Case Management Care Coordination. We're going to put a link on there for the DHR EHS grant, and we'll have um, we'll probably have a we'll have the protocol and the guidance there. And there's also going to be a link sent out to you in LCMS for you to complete a very short quiz. This is how we keep track of the fact that you've um, completed the training. So we'll need you to do that so that we can log in that you've completed the training. Oh, and we have a call from Houston County. So uh, we'll stop just a second and go ahead and take our call from Houston County. Go ahead. Hi, I was calling to ask about the number of slides for the Early Head Start and Child Care Partnership that you have. What does number of slides mean? Number what? The number of slots, so the number of children. Oh, slots equal children. Slots equal children. So, um, you know, every county that's participating of the counties that Sean had gone through, each um, county has a different number of children actually participating. Houston might have 65, whereas Jefferson could have 90. And I just use those, pull those numbers out of the air. Okay. Does that help? It does. And I have another question. Sure. What if the parent refuses services? Okay. There's a question on the provider report uh, that specifically asks, did the parent accept services? Um, then you would, um, if you say no on that, then you would want to document in your notes why the pay, why the parent refused services, and then you would need to submit a provider report. And in the additional comment section of the provider report to referring provider, you would just indicate the reason why the parent um, refused services, and so um, that would just be, you know, that would be how you would handle that. I would hope that um, we won't have too many refusals. Okay, yes. and then one last question. Oh, but I want to follow up on that just a second. I'm sorry. If you do have a parent that refuses, I would like for you to please send an email to Melissa Godwin and tell her who the patient was. Okay, because email we, Melissa. Yeah, email Melissa when you have a patient to refuse because we're going to need to communicate that information back to DHR immediately. We want to go ahead and talk to them about that. The provider report that you're completing, it's dropping into that spreadsheet. We don't, okay. send that, we don't send the spreadsheet on a daily basis. It's more of a quarterly basis that we're sending that. So we would want to communicate back with DHR as soon as possible if a family has decided not to accept services. So okay. if a patient refuses, go ahead and email Melissa Godwin the name of the patient that refused services so we can get in touch with DHR. Okay. And you can go ahead with your next question. And, okay. And I was going to also say, I was, oh, was going to mention just a to add to what um, Meredith was saying and just thinking about, you know, if you've, let's say if you've got a, you get a referral and you've worked with this family before in the past and they've, you know, this family, they're real leery of government folks. They don't want government in their life. And, you know, there's a long history of refusing services just in general from the health department. Right. That, that's where what you might want to do is you may want to look at the approach of, hey, I'm calling the person at Head Start and I'm going to go over and I'm going to set up a time because and to maybe meet with the Head Start person and meet with the family and try to sell the program that way because I think if you get, if Head Start is there with you and they are trying to encourage the parent to participate in the program, you may get, a, you, the, the parent may say, okay, yeah, definitely. I understand, you know, that kind of thing. It's not just some government agency. This is something. 
um, you know, to help my family. I think that um, because these families, they are, they may have already have that relationship established with the Head Start Center or that particular staff person, they might just buy into it a little bit more um, readily if you've got that Head Start person there trying to encourage the services as well. Okay. Then my last question. Does the parent know about this program yet? You know, you all have already had the conference call with the partners. So have you all sent out anything to the parents informing them of us contacting them? No, ma'am. We have not sent out anything to the parent. When you make that initial call to them, then, um, then you know, you will be explaining about the program to them. And one of the, in, in the guidance, I, I'm pretty confident in the guidance, we put something in there about a recommendation to set up a meeting with the early Head Start staff and go and meet with them and let them know, hey, these are the people that I'm going to be contacting. Would it be possible for you to kind of give them a heads up and let them know that I'll be getting in touch with them? We think that the key to this is going to be partnering with that early Head Start Center staff. I think that they're going to help you be able to engage the family a little bit better, and it might be good to meet with the family there at the Head Start Center, but they could be coming into the health department as well for WIC and those types of services. So just, I'm pretty sure we put in that guidance to touch base with that early Head Start staff so that you can talk to them about what the program is about. And any time that they have questions, you're more than welcome to have them give Melissa or I a call, and we're happy to, to help them understand the program a little better as well. But we have, we have educated the Early Head Start staff about the program, and, um, but it could be that somebody, I think all of the Head Start folks were on that conference call except maybe one person. So, you know, it could be that that one person may not be aware or someone has forgotten. So you might have to do some re-education of the early Head Start staff. If you run into some issues like that and, the, and, you, and you get the sense that the particular Head Start Center doesn't really seem to understand what's going on, let me know and I'll call that um, local Head Start Center and the community partner because the way it's set up, the way this program works is there is, a, <clears throat> I'm going to say, a, a they call them a community partner. And a community partner has several Head Start centers. That community partner is the person who's making sure that, for example, all eight or ten of these Head Start centers are doing what they're supposed to do. So depending on what's going on, it may be that I call the community partner who's over ten of the Head Start programs and making sure that this grant's working the way it's supposed to. And it could be um, it's an issue for the whole area, you know, that's, um, that, they, that there's not good understanding of what our role is. And maybe that community partner can help to explain that to each individual site as well. And to follow up with your question a little bit more about what the Early Head Start centers know and the families know, I've done a training with the directors of the Head Start centers, and then I've also gone over to Auburn and met with the, the people that are involved with the family daycare centers and done trainings with them as well. So I've met with most of the players as well and gone over what the health department does, what type of services we provide, and a brief overview of what this program is going to be doing for them as well. So hopefully they have a little bit of a heads up. You shouldn't be going in there with them completely unknowing and cold. They, they, should, they have some primers as to what's going on because we've met with them um, in several, several times as well. So hopefully that will help. And Meredith, I think it's yes, very important that we also approach the family in the same manner. We need to go in and provide them with resources, available mm -hmm. resources, present ourselves as an additional resource, not something um, separate or as a, uh, coming from DHR as some sort of punitive service, but we want to present as a resource to them so they'll be more willing to accept the program. Mm -hmm. Yes, excellent point. And so I want to ask about the that the caller mentioned earlier, if someone refuses, does that slot then open back up so that another child can be put in that? My understanding, it's supposed to, but that's all with DHR and they decide when to add and remove children. So that if you're sharing that, when you're sharing that information uh, with us, then what I'll do is turn around and get that information 
immediately back to DHR. So if they can add children, because uh, Dr. Moore had said they would be able to add children um, to the program. They may not be in the same place that the refusal right. was in. Right. right. And in that same vein, we have another email question. How do the children get chosen for the program? The Department of Human Resources uh, did that selection. It's based on the risk factors we spoke of earlier about the teen mothers, poverty-stricken uh, counties, and uh, families uh, suffering from neglect and abuse. So those, how, those are how they were uh, selected. Yes, we have no control over who the participants are. That information is given to us from DHR. This, again, is a grant, and they had certain criteria for the children that are involved in the grant. So we just kind of get the names of the children from DHR, and we are happy to see whoever they send to us. So, uh, just going to give you another chance to send in any email questions or to call us with any questions. We still have a little bit more time. Um, Wanted to remind you, uh, I think Melissa and Sean touched on this very well, but just want to reiterate, when you're approaching the families through this grant, I would highly recommend you do not use DHR when you're talking to them. We want to call this the Early Head Start Grant. All of your forms in ACORN say DHR, EHS. That's kind of for an internal bookkeeping purposes for data. But when you're talking to the families, try real hard to just use Early Head Start Grant. Early Head Start. Just use EHS Early Head Start. That's how you want to engage your families with this and explain to them how you've gotten linked up with them. It's through their Early Head Start program. Uh, anytime that you have questions or concerns about the program, if you would, please email those to Melissa or to Sean. Uh, once we finish up today, if something pops up that you have a question about, you can email Melissa and Sean those questions and concerns, and they are more than happy to, to take care of those. So give you one more opportunity. Uh, if you have any questions, concerns, issues, anything in general, you're welcome to call or email us, and we are happy to take those questions. We are super excited about this grant. We think it's a great opportunity. Uh, this, again, want to reiterate, we are billing to a separate entity now. We are not billing just to Medicaid. Uh, as I've described it to many people, we've taken our basket and we've put another egg in it. So we've got another egg in our basket of who we're able to bill to. So we're very excited that this is an opportunity to bill to another agency besides Medicaid, which is broadening our scope. So we're, we're really excited that we have this opportunity. Uh, and if you have any questions or concerns, please do not hesitate to call or email us about that, and we're more than happy to help you. We want to be successful in this. So if you have questions, we want to take care of those and make sure that we're doing this to the best of our abilities. So I want to thank Melissa and Sean. They've done a wonderful job today of taking us through the training. And once we finish up today, again, please don't hesitate to call or email us with questions. And as soon as we get all of our kinks worked out of ACORN, we just have a couple more changes to make. And once we get the data squared away to drop into CCRS, we're going to send you an email and let you know, hey, those referrals are going to be coming in the next day or two. So we'll give you a heads up before they come out. And then uh, officially when we start sending them, we're going to notify you as well so that you know, hey, the DHR, EHS referrals are in the system. So we'll let you know about that as well. So thank you again for your time today. We appreciate everything that you do. You've got the hardest job out there. So you're doing a great job. And if you need anything, please don't hesitate to call or email anytime. Thanks, and you all have a great day.